everybody. Great to see you here. I am uh, one of your hosts today, Dr. Ryan Stover. Joining me today is Dr. Chris Paul. Morning. And we're here to present some live streaming research. And this is a very exciting opportunity here. It's an entire semester's worth of uh, work here that we're going to get to see in a brief five to seven minute presentation of the students here. But before Dr. Paul talks a little bit about the students' research, I want to talk a little about the students behind the scenes here. Uh, one of the cool things we get to do here is we get to collaborate. And so ComLab, one of the classes I'm getting to teach this semester is producing this. So this event is all live student original research and all live student produced. And it's pretty cool here. We have a couple different cameras here. So we have a new one. We have Skycam. Uh, so Skycam, for a small monthly donation, you could be the sponsor of it. It could be uh, brought to you by you. Uh, but that's one of the new innovations here. So between the presentations, you'll kind of get to see what's going on behind the scenes in the studio and the control room here as we produce this live event. So Dr. Paul is going to talk a little about the research the students are going to be talking about now. Thanks, Dr. Stouffer. If you were to talk to any of the students that are about to present right now, they would say that it is a monumental task to have to cram together a research project in three months. And it is the truth. Uh, back in September, all of these students started out with a concept, uh, a basic communication phenomenon that they were interested in studying. From there, they had to develop that. Uh, they had to gather research. They had to figure it out more. They had to become the subject expert on, this, uh, on the communication phenomenon that they were studying. From there, they took time to be able to understand methodology, be able to do proper uh, ethical research, how to collect a sample, how to write survey questions, how to actually operationalize the, the actual concepts that they wanted to go and examine and actually ask a prediction, pose a prediction, and then actually be able to pre present some results about it. And the culmination of that is what you're about to see here in the next hour or so and we are very proud of these students as i said it, it's it's a monumental task to be able to do this in three months or less and uh just as dr stouffer was mentioning about how com lab is a collaboration doing this research project is a collaboration for these students and uh, i'm really excited for what you're going to get to be able to share and be able to witness here as they talk about this research that they've accomplished thanks very much for tuning in and enjoy these presentations
I'm Hunter Stennett and this is Valerie Mitchell. And this is our study, Casual Dress, How Students Perceive Professors Based on How They Dress in the Classroom. Our study was to see if professors' clothing non-verbally communicates approachability and credibility to students. We are using the symbolic interactionism theory, which is the communication through symbols with three core principles of meaning, language, and thought. Our purpose of the study was to use this theory to see if students' perceptions of professors were based on their clothing choices. Perceptions of clothing are constantly evolving. These were the findings discovered by John, Lennon, and Rudd in 2014. These findings helped us begin formulating our hypotheses. We looked at their study and began to think of ways we could use their findings to help frame our own study. The secret message behind clothing. Within this study, the researchers found that women that scored highly on the survey were closely related to the lower scoring men who took the survey. Whereas the lower scoring women were more similar with the higher scoring men and connections between their personality and clothing choices. This study helped to prove the importance of clothing as a form of nonverbal communication, which helps to support a study by Armstrong, Kang, and Lang in 2018. According to Griffin in 2009, symbolic interactionism is communication through symbols. There are three core principles incorporated with this theory, meaning, language, and thought. To explain this theory, I'm going to use the example of a Rolex watch and how that watch is oftentimes a symbol of wealth. So using this example, if there was a man wearing a Rolex and another gentleman was to be lost and noticed that the man next to him was wearing a Rolex, he may be less likely to ask that man for directions because he has ass assigned Rolexes to wealthy people and also assigned wealthy people to being snobby. This means that individuals create their own meanings and interpretations of different objects. When Rolex watches were created, they were not already associated with wealthy people. An object is not created with a pre-existent meaning attached to it. Language is what creates meaning towards an object or symbol. Valerie and I use this theory to help us understand how and why people have certain views and assumptions about professors based on their clothing choices. Our first hypothesis was that male faculty will be perceived as more approachable than female faculty when they dress casually. This was to see if there is a difference between female and male faculty in regard to approachability when dressed casually. Our second hypothesis was that female faculty will be perceived as less credible than male faculty when they dress casually. This hypothesis was to see if there is a difference between female and male faculty in regard to credibility when dressed casually. The participants of this survey were current Longwood University students. In total, we had 81 students participate in the survey. This was a convenient sample. Only three demographic questions were asked during the survey. Valerie and I only found it necessary to ask demographic questions regarding sex, age, and class standing within the research. We constructed a 21-question survey online with Google Forms. Once receiving IRB approval, the survey was distributed via email and social media. The data was collected by a seven-point agreeable Likert scale, meaning the participants were given seven different answer choices, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. The research questions were tailored specifically to compare male faculty versus female faculty's approachability and credibility. The questions were developed on the grounding of the social interactionism theory. One of the survey questions read, you perceive male professors to be more approachable when dressed casually. The same question was also used when exploring a female professor's approachability. That question read, you perceive female professors to be more approachable when dressed casually. The participants were then given a seven point agreeable Likert scale to answer the statement. The first hypothesis was male faculty will be perceived as more approachable than female faculty when they dress casually. The t-test found no significant effect on perception of approachability. The second hypothesis was female faculty will be perceived as less credible than male faculty when they dress casually. 
The teachers found significance, however, the significant difference found is that female professors are perceived as more credible than male professors. This is the opposite of what Hypothesis 2 predicted, therefore Hypothesis 2 fails to be supported. In regard to practical implications, these findings will help to inform female professors that they do not need to base their outfit choices off of their teaching schedule because students will not base their, pe their female professors' credibility and approachability on their clothing. For the theoretical implications, these results build on existing evidence that an object is not created with meaning. The meaning is attached after it has been created, according to Griffin in 2009. With that being said, clothing that has been labeled as casual was not created already being casual. Instead, the clothing was labeled to be casual after it was created, meaning clothing once labeled as casual can adapt and become a different type of clothing because it was not created with a meaning already attached. For this research project, there were some limitations that may have had an influence on the data, which included sample size, sex of sample size, and length of time given to gather data. Future research should pursue looking into if age of the professors has any effect on one's perception of credibility and approachability, also increasing their time to gather data and gain a larger, more balanced sample size. In conclusion, all college students have professors of different sexes that dress differently. Some dress more professionally and some tend to dress more casually. The purpose of this study was to see to what extent college students find casually and professionally dressed female and male professors to be more or less approachable or credible. While we did not find significance, this could be due to our limitations. More research should be done on this study and thank you for tuning in. Have a nice day. Hi, I'm Taylor Berry. And I'm Devin Alston. Our research is called The Effect of Instagram on College Students. Instagram is a growing platform that has new years users every day. And with this growing platform has influencers that join the app, as well as the evolution of photo editing apps like Facetune and Photoshop. Um, influencers use these apps to conform their bodies to the beauty standards of today. For example, a fashion model could use Photoshop to make her waist look thinner. And in 2018, Crawford conducted a study where BBC found that Instagram and popular hashtags promote eating disorders like bulimia and anorexia. And our purpose was to find how Instagram affected college students both physically and emotionally. So literature that was relevant to us is 
Che um, did a research how social media presence affects women's emotions, specifically jealousy, and specific subcategories in this study were comparison, exposure, and self-esteem. For this study, the je- women experience a lot of jealousy. Um, Fardoli did a study between women in the United States and Australia, and many women compared themselves to celebrities in this, specifically celebrities' bodies. And in 2018, Bryant University conducted a study on Instagram use and self-esteem. And in this study, they found the more you use Instagram, the more satisfied you are with your life. Social comparison theory was created in 1954 by Leon Festinger and suggests that people compare their lives to get to others to get a sense of value and self-worth. This self-evaluation could be in the form of upward social comparison, where we compare people who we believe are better off than us, and then downward social comparison where we believe people are worse off than us. Uh, Social comparison theory is important because it explains why people in um, society constantly compare themselves to others. Um, In a 2018 study about uh, teens' Facebook use in relation to social comparison, Che found that, quote, those who frequently see influencers' social media and those who are interested in the postings of daily lives of influencers are more likely to compare their lives of those of influencers, end quote. Based on our literature review and theoretical grounding, we propose three hypotheses. Hypothesis one, frequent Instagram users are more likely to experience an upward social comparison and body image issues than infrequent users. Hypothesis two, frequent Instagram users are more likely to experience influencer envy than infrequent users. And hypothesis three, Instagram users who spend more time on the platform are more likely to feel unhappy and dissatisfied with their life. The study was conducted over a two-week period and used 12-question survey to receive the data effects of Instagram as well as the demographic information of the participants. It was distributed through Google Forms as well as personal social media accounts like Facebook and Twitter, and the Law and Communication Studies Department also had it on their social media accounts. We had a total of 139 responses, and 74.8% were female and 25.2% were male. Participants were asked to answer their questions on a Likert type scale from 1 to 5, 1 being very untrue of them and 5 being very true of them. We used 12 questions based on three hypotheses of body issues, influencer envy, and happiness. On the perceptive of body image, most of the participants said that it was untrue of them to compare their bodies to influencers and celebrities that they follow on Instagram. Um, When asked if celebrities or influencers' lives were more desirable than their own, participants thought this was true of them. Although many of them said that they would not buy a product if an influencer or celebrity advertised it. So for hypothesis one, we found no significance between frequent Instagram use and unhappy with your body image. For hypothesis two, we found no significance between increased usage and influencer envy. And for hypothesis three, we found no significance between frequent Instagram use and decreased happiness. For practical implications, we presume that participants might have not been honest with the questions since they were slightly personal. Um, And for theoretical implications, social comparison theory should be adapted to social media platforms and the use of them by users. The theory does not include or explain the implications of how people comparing aspects of their lives to celebrities or influences via social media might affect them socially, physically, and mentally. So some of the limitations were unequal responses between sexes. Um, There were more women than men that responded, so the results were skewed. Um, Also, Longwood is typically more, has more females, so that skewed it from the beginning. Typically, females are more sensitive about body image questions and emotional questions, so that could cause them to answer untruthfully on the survey. And again, the sample size of Longwood is smaller compared to other colleges, so we didn't get as many responses as we wanted. For future research, we suggest that researchers conduct the same survey but uh, focus on the sex of the participants. Since there is no significance in our hypotheses, future researchers should expand their population to students from other colleges. We also suggest that organizers focus on, we also suggest that researchers organize focus groups to help eliminate chances of untruthful answers. In conclusion, the purpose of this study was to test if Instagram users are jealous of influencers on the platform and to see if their body image as well as their emotions were affected by the amount of time they spend on the app. With the research we conducted um, on the effect of Instagram on college-age students, 
We now have a better understanding of social comparison theory and how it might affect young adults' perspectives of oneself when spending time on Instagram. Thank you for watching our presentation. Hi, my name is Andrew Slifka, and standing beside me is my research partner, Vivian Gray. Our study covers students' response to popular politicians' tweets in the aftermath of mass shootings. Politicians have taken to social media to try to bring hope and reassurance to the American people as mass shootings have spiked in the past 20 years. According to Park, Twitter has shown that opinion leaders actively search for information, mobilization, and expression of public opinions, furthermore leading towards increased political engagement. There is an importance in feeling safe in a school's community and as well as it is important for influential politicians to understand they are making a difference and that their messages are influencing people's emotions and feelings. Recognizing the importance of safety on Twitter can help get these messages across. The purpose of the study was to evaluate the youth's response to politicians' tweets after mass shootings. In doing so, we determined how supporters from liberal and conservative belief systems respond to different Twitter posts from both Democratic and Republican leaders. Based off the selected empirical articles, there were two main themes that occurred, social media and political assurance. These themes are important because they show the influence of social media platforms, such as Twitter, and how politicians utilize these platforms to influence their following. In 2015, Maurice, Maurice Vergeer talked about the rapid growth of Twitter. He stated that the platform is becoming one of the most used and most informative mediums for politicians. Because of this, politicians have the ability to create their own political agenda, and the American people have access to this information at the tips of their fingers. In 2018, Bronstein, Aroni, and Barilan 
looked into how politicians utilize social media for electoral purposes. This research found that politicians do not use social media as a platform to promote their ideas, plans, or strategies. Instead, they use it to improve and maintain their relationship with their following. This shows that politicians strategically set their agenda with the goal of strengthening their levels of trust and assurement with their followers. The agenda setting theory came to fruition in 1972 by Maxwell McCombs and Donald Shaw. The theory states that media pushes out certain sets of information more than others depending on what the media deems as the most worthy to the mass population of their audience. However, this theory claims that the media does not try to sway the opinions or beliefs of the audience in doing so, stated by Little John and Foss. This theory helped us understand the media's influence and how much attention was brought to each tweet from the politician used within this study. There is importance in considering how major news outlets interact with different politicians and how that could potentially affect the messages within their tweets. Whether it be a retweet, favorite, or a simple interaction, it creates a platform where the tweet gains publicity and attention. Based on the review of literature and theoretical grounding, the following hypotheses were proposed. Our first hypothesis states that conservative tweets will be, served, will be perceived as more assuring than liberal tweets. Overall, regardless of the participants' political affiliation, we predicted that more conservative tweets will be perceived as reassuring by college students. Our second hypothesis predicts that conservative participants will perceive conservative tweets more reassuring than liberal tweets, and our third hypothesis, hypothesis states that liberal participants will perceive conservative tweets more reassuring than liberal tweets. In this study, Longwood University students were asked over a week to participate in our survey. In the original report, the survey received 86 responses from students on campus. After reviewing the responses, we noticed six respondents failed to answer at least one question within our survey. Since the six participants did not answer all the questions, we deleted them from our study, leaving only 80 responses. At the beginning of the survey, we added a statement to reassure and explain that the tweets used within the study are from actual politicians, not ones we created by ourselves. The survey presented through Google Forms and featured multiple tweets on behalf of politicians in response to generally recent mass shooting events. The overall survey consisted of 15 questions. The first 12 questions were tweets responding to mass shootings. Half were from Democratic politicians, and the other half were from Republican politicians. The responses to the tweets range on a scale from 1 to 5, whether the tweet is not assuring or extremely assuring. In an effort to discover the altered levels of assurance among different tweets, it was necessary to make each tweet anonymous. Each tweet was taken and screenshotted directly from Twitter's archives. Politicians such as Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Mike Pence, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Ted Cruz are some of the politicians included in this survey. The participants' political affiliation made up the independent variable, and the level of assurance of the politicians' tweets was the dependent variable of this study. After conducting three separate t-tests, we, re we received all the data we needed for our research. Our first, hypothesis, our first hypothesis could not be supported as the assurance rate was higher than the conservatives rate when we took the averages. In testing our second hypothesis, we found that conservatives found liberal tweets more assuring than conservative tweets with a higher average as well. Our second hypothesis could not be supported as there was no significance. In our third and final test, we found that liberal participants found liberal tweets to have a higher average than conservative tweets. Therefore, our third and final hypothesis could not be supported as the significance did not support the hypothesis. A practical implication of this research is that the participant intended to find their own political party's tweets more assuring, which confirms that the participants' preconceived biases of politician, politicians are a factor in determining their own assurance levels. Overall, the participants, no matter their political affiliation, found none of the messages that included in the survey as very reassuring. Based on the findings, most of the participants found the tweets provided only moderately assuring. In regard to theoretical implications, considering the agenda setting theory, people use media and social media more specifically as their main source for news. With the rising popularity of Twitter as a news outlet, politicians will be more prevalent on Twitter and post more about the news and current events. The biggest limitation that we faced in the study was the campus that the survey was conducted on. 
We focus only on one campus and only let students complete the survey for one week. If the survey was sent out to more universities, it might have received more responses as well as reached different areas where the political leanings could differ from Longwoods. If the survey was also distributed for a longer period of time, like a month instead of a week, it could generate more response. Further research could be conducted by focusing on another major news event, such as uh, elections, changes in government, or current events. Another idea would to be discovering how participants vote differently depending on who they follow on Twitter. In closing, we measured the levels of American reassurement in response to the tweets of Democratic and Republican politicians in the aftermath of a national mass shooting. Despite finding significance in the first and third hypotheses, they could not be supported after calculating the results. Thank you for joining us and listening to our research. Good morning. My name is Kurt Martin. And I'm Matt Oliver. And we're very excited to be here with you this morning to present our research title, Exploring the Effects of Reception of Instagram Posts. We'll go ahead and send it over to Matt, give a little bit of a topic background. So for our background, uh, we looked at Instagram, of course, which Instagram is a main social media outlet with roughly 1 billion monthly users, according to SproutSocial.com. On, on the platform, users can like, comment, post videos, post photos, uh, you can post stories, it's just an interactive platform. For the purpose of our study, uh, we wanted an in-depth look at Instagram users from Longwood University and the correlation between their interaction and social media self-esteem. For our literature review, uh, we found three commonalities within everything we looked at. Uh, these were post and comment categorization, effects resulting from post reception, and inclusive alternative outlets on Instagram. For the post and comment categorization, a study done by Hu and Kamhapti in 2014 categorized Instagram posts based on what was depicted, such as selfies, nature posts, food, etc. A similar study done by Ward in 2016 examined comments on popular celebrity posts where they often found comments such as, how can I be like you? which showed the interaction uh, that users would have with these main popular users. For the effects resulting from post reception, uh, each of these studies looked at 
teens and young adults and found that there's a correlation between depression and low self-esteem related to Instagram use. And now moving into the inclusive, inclusive alternative outlets on Instagram, we looked at a study from Caldera and DeRitter that looked into multiple uh, inclusive outlets on Instagram for body positivity and inclusivity. And we found one particular page that they highlighted is called F Your Body Standards. And it's a place where people of multiple body types, ethnic backgrounds, races, religion, no matter what it is, can go and show themselves off if they don't have that natural conforming body. And we actually, through that study, found out that Instagram in the past has deleted photos of those non-conforming bodies or people who have posted them with the hashtag of curvy. And sort of in light of this, there are Instagram models who showcase products or basically promote themselves and do have those conforming bodies that have social media self-esteem effects on the people who are looking to post on things like F Your Body Standards. And it's a, it's a, excuse me, is a page that has over 430,000 followers, so much of a following with it. In our theoretical grounding, we decided to use a self-affirmation theory. And this theory basically says that individuals seek to satiate their fundamental need for self-worth by consciously or unconsciously attending to information that conforms to the most valued central aspects of their self-concept. This basically means that people relate to what they feel brings them up, their self-esteem, and will interact with posts that they agree with or people that, you know, think the same way that they do. So our hypothesis, uh, individuals with higher levels of social media self-esteem will not perceive the need of high levels of social media interaction. And our method, first we had to get IRB approval before we were able to send out our 19 question survey through the Google Forms system. Uh, we shared the survey after approval through our personal social media. We sent it through our school email and along with Canvas. And after we closed the survey, we had primarily female respondents, which was 68%, and 31% was male, with the last 1% being uh, with withholding that information. And in our measures, we mainly use five-point Likert type scale questions, ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So one would be strongly disagree, and five would be strongly agree. And you see an example there on your screen. I rarely post photos on Instagram. An example from our survey ranged from strongly disagree to strongly agree. After looking through all the results from our 119 usable participants for the t-test uh, between the correlation of self-esteem and interaction on Instagram, we were able to find significant results which further uh, promoted our hypothesis and concluded it there. And actually there was a question from our survey that asked, are you more likely to like a post no matter who it's from? And it had 72 respond or 72 percent of respondents that agreed with that. So basically, and it also uh, confirms the self-affirmation theory. So for the discussion with practical implications, uh, this study had similar results to previous studies that we had looked through, uh, which helps bolster their arguments as well as our own. We found that users interact with people they connect themselves, and oftentimes there are negative effects from ones they don't connect with or the ones that they wanted to be like and weren't. And like I mentioned there, the self-affirmation uh, self affirmation theory and its principles were supported in this study with there being a correlation between social media self-esteem and interaction. And that basically users of Instagram cater to posts that they agree with or increase their self-esteem. And like I mentioned on the previous slide, the question there, do you like a post because of who posted it, not based on actual content? 72% of our respondents agreed with that statement, either strongly agreed or agreed. So further bolstering the argument of the self-affirmation theory. Limitations in future research. With a Google Form survey, we cannot guarantee that every person was a Longwood University student, is a university that uh, bases itself off ethnicality, but we cannot base our research consistently on the fact that everyone was a Longwood student. Um, research was only 119 people 
and there are a billion monthly users of Instagram, so very small sample size there. And in spots, our questions weren't direct enough to what we were looking for. So if we had to do it again, we would redo our questions in ways to make it more direct of what we were looking for. And respondents were primarily female, like Matt mentioned, with 68% being female. And for future research, we recommend uh, Instagram does a survey themselves. That's the best way to get a large uh, sample size. And if someone else were to do the research, I would recommend sharing it to paid survey sites just to implement and just pay people that take it. It would increase the sample size as well. And in conclusion, this study can make ways for Instagram to be able to monitor their users through their posts and be able to notice their demeanor. And there's a correlation between social media self-esteem and interaction habits on Instagram. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the shows. Hi everyone, I'm Haley Cunningham and I'm Addie Clark and our research study is going to look into social media's influence on fashion. So our topic looks into fashion trends and how these trends are influenced by popular figures and celebrity styles and how these styles are presented through the social media platform. And it also looks into how not only customers benefit from social media and how they can look at all the new fashion trends, but also brand creators and designers because they can interact one-on-one -on -one and more easily with their customers. So the purpose of this study is to look into how social media influences fashion and how people perceive that. So with this topic, we wanted to look up other researchers' topics to kind of get a better understanding of how we should conduct our experiment. So through one article that we reviewed, it focused on how people use social media to influence a specific organization or a group of people. Um, it's the main thing that it looked at was uh, how the individuals actually use the social media to aim that specific message to those groups. Um, it looked into the differences between social media usage and um, social media's engagement to see how they can uh, conduct those messages. Uh, another article that we reviewed investigated how social media communication can affect um, brand equity, brand attitude, and customers' intent to purchase that specific outfit or brand. Uh, this focused on social media communication and how it can influence a consumer's uh, fashion style or what they decide to buy or don't buy. 
so by looking at these types of different research articles, it kind of helped us uh, figure out how we wanted to conduct our experiment and look into further social, me social media's communication and um, its influences. So the theory that we used to ground this research was cultivation theory, and this theory looks into how prolonged media exposure can affect someone's perception of reality and what's, you know, realistic in the world. So we wanted to relate this to our study because prolonged media exposure um, for social media can influence someone's fashion sense and fashion trends, and they're able to see, you know, every day what people are posting and what is up to date on the latest trends. So that prolonged exposure kind of relates back to the cultivation theory. Uh, for our research, we came up with two somewhat different um, hypotheses. The first one was that um, frequent users of social media will be more likely to uh, be early adopters of a new fashion trend than infrequent users of social media. And the second one was infrequent users of social media will be less likely to have their style influenced by uh, social media brand influencers than frequent users. Uh, we investigated these questions to uh, determine the answer and also get a better understanding of what comes into play and how people perceive uh, fashion and why they change their style to fit with the new trends. In past research, it was shown that social media is tied into fashion, not only with consumers, but also with the brands themselves. So for this study, we had a convenient sample of 55 students from Longwood University, and 81.8% of these participants were female and 18.2% of the participants were male and these participants were asked to fill out and complete the survey which was 14 questions. The survey was sent out online by direct message and by email. We decided on doing a survey because we wanted to obtain information quickly and we wanted to get or to distribute the survey to as many people as possible. So in our survey it consisted of 14 uh, questions that were not done in previous survey. It took the participants two to four minutes to complete the whole survey. Um, we wanted to, to focus on three different groups, uh, which were how social media influences fashion, how um, brand influencers on social media influence fashion trends, and how uh, frequent the participants actually spend on social media. Um, so the questions that were asked were kind of similar to when I see a fashion advertisement presented on social media, I am fast to adopt my style to that trend, uh, to which a participant could answer from a Likert scale ranging from one to five, one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. So after running a one-tailed t-test, we determined that the results were not significant and our hypothesis would not, was not supported due to, this, due to this insignificant difference. So for fashion adoption and their use of social media, there was no significant difference, but it did show that there was frequent, well, frequent social media users having a higher um, score than infrequent social media users. And when it came to fashion brand influencers and their use of social media, there was also no significant difference, showing that there was um, frequent social media users receiving a higher score than infrequent. So for our practical implications, though there was no significant difference in the two hypotheses, the re, uh, we found that um, the more someone actually does use social media, it does have some impact on um, how or if they are influenced. One implication um, that played a part in our research and our findings was that though most answered to not buying the products, it was mostly due to them not having enough money uh, for the product they want to buy or brands they want to look into. And our theoretical implication, while the study didn't uh, really examine the long-term exposure of social media, it still uh, made a connection to the cultivation theory by looking into how media can influence the perception of fashion trends um, and its influences. Uh, this theory guided our research and allowed us to identify how frequent me uh, media usage can potentially affect um, the way people perceive fashion trends and how uh, well they are influenced. So for the limitations, we had subjects and we put that on there because we only use Longwood University as our participants and also because our age range was, was from 18 to 23. Uh, questions is on there because our questions were more asked towards female audience rather than male audience and our questions weren't as detailed as we would have liked them to be. Distribution is another limitation because our survey was only distributed for a week and it was only through direct message and email. For future research, we intend to fix these problems. So with questions, we're going to create a more unbiased 
uh, base question so that we have an equal amount of female and male respondents and have a more detailed question. So if the participant answers too strongly disagree, we can figure out why they actually answer to it. For the demographic, we, um, like I said, want to have an equal amount of male and female. So that means to fix the questions and have a wider subject area so not only Longwood students can take it, but anyone can. For the distribution, we're of course going to start earlier, and since we don't have to worry about just Longwood students taking it, we can post it on social media. So the results of this experiment show that no matter how long a person spends on social media or if they follow you know, brand influencers, it doesn't have a strong effect on if that person has a sense of style or not. So fewer limitations and future research could provide better results for this study. Thank you for tuning into our research study. Mike and I'm Ian and our research study is perceived social support through smartphones so in this research what is being examined is how social support is, in, is influenced by the use of smartphones in an ever-increasing world of technology this research looks to examine how it can best meet the social support needs of others through either through phone or text the purpose of the study is to better understand what is perceived as more socially supportive, a call or a text. Past, res past research of social support gives us an insight to how networking, networking could give more effective, more effective for users. Past research also suggested that technology makes social support more accessible for social support groups. A study conducted by Pollock discusses the handling of phone calls to Samaritans as emotional support services. What we found was that volunteers answered phone calls that were, that were more optimistic and open-minded. This shows the effect of strategic social support through phone calls. In order to establish theoretical grounding of social support, we must first define it. Uh, Katrina and Russell define social support as the interpersonal behaviors of members and persons' social network that may help them successfully cope with challenging events and circumstances. Rather than a specific spirit, uh, theory, uh, Katrina and Russell choose to explain it as a uh, construct. Um, as a multidimensional phenomenon, social support is an intricate and complicated phenomenon that is influenced by many things as opposed to just one or two. For instance, if a, family, if a member of the family has recently passed away or a, a friend might try to console you, um, you your uh, friend can choose from a multitude of ways to do so. In addition, how that friend tries to console you could also depend on the particular member of the family who has passed. Other points of consideration could be your relationship with a friend as well as the relationship with a family member who has passed both of which could greatly influence the strategy of social support offered by your friend. Understanding social support as a multidimensional phenomenon helps frame this study to look at a specific context. 
for our, res our research question stated, how is social support influenced by the use of smartphones? Um, this helped frame our study in the context of social support. Um, our hypothesis stated that phone calls would be perceived as more socially supportive than text messages. Um, this, our hypothesis fills the research gap by using previous literature to make an educated guess on social support within a specific context, uh, within a specific communica communication channel of the smartphone. For our method, a study sample of 54 participants were, were recruited through the use of online, an online survey distributed through, via email, Facebook, and Canvas. Participants, participants fell in between, were, were in the age between 18 to 23. And the demographic uh, distribution was 83% Caucasian, 9.3% African American, 5.16% Hispanic, and 1.9% Asian. A correlated s sample t-test was u was used a five a five point a five a Likert type scale, which was used. Participants be participants also this allowed um, the the survey allowed a significant difference uh, for our survey. Questions were designed with the purpose to change the independent variable f through a phone call or text to test the effects dependent. To test the effects of the dependent variable, which was perceived social support, this was done by giving partic participants neutral questions testing for perceived social support. Half the questions had a variation of smart variation of call smartphone use, while the other half had a variation of text smartphone use. The, the Likert scale perceived social support from one strongly to disagree, and five to strongly agree. The survey was ten questions long, five testing for call and five testing for text. In addition, a question of consent was given as well as three additional questions for demographics. Um, again, um, it was hypothesized that phone call would be perceived as more socially supportive than text. Upon completion of the correlated samples t-test we used, there was significant difference on perceived social support. Results indicate higher perceived social support for phone call than text. Therefore, our hypothesis was supported. The practical implications of this research can help inform everyone on how they can better socially support those around them. Either it be family, friends, coworkers, or other loved ones, calling is the best way to reach out and offer that support. Um, our research also could help support groups and pertain to that. Support groups can emphasize the importance and value behind using phone calls to connect with, un with one another. Phone calls could especially make a difference for individuals who are unable or uncomfortable to make it to the support group meetings. Um, the theoretical grounding of this study connects directly to our research and offers interpretation. Rather than text message, phone call is perceived as more socially supportive. This makes sense if social support is to be understood as a multidimensional phenomenon. Rather than text, phone call is a channel of communication that is instantaneous. This allows individuals to communicate more clearly and efficiently, allowing a person to give social support significantly better because the channel of communication allows a way for individuals to assess the full context of a situation. The limitations of this research can be found in the sample size and demographics. Having 54 participants, participants limits the, how accurate and how truly representative the population this study can be held to. In addition, the age range of participants was limited to through 18 through 23, and minorities, minorities were not represented than higher than 10%. We did not evaluate the perceived effectiveness of social support and did not examine any kinds of specific, specific social support as well. For future research, uh, sh um, researchers should explore studying perceived social support of phone call and video call on smartphones. Both forms of communication are instantaneous, except video call allows individuals to also see one another. With the only increasing usage of video telephone technologies, research on social support's new role in this technology is important. Future research should also consider further studying the use and application of phone calls in support groups. While there is some research studying already on this topic, we believe there's a long way to go and a breakthrough could help a lot of people in a positive way. As researchers, we, under as researchers, we understand that there are many different types of social support, as emotional su such as emotional support and tangible support. Future researchers should explore these roles of different kinds of social support in relation to, f to future and new technologies. From this study and previous others, phone calls are generally easier and accessible to connect with and allows easier communication as well. The study helped us learn the different forms of communication of social support through smartphone use. 
Thank you for tuning in. in Thank you for tuning in. (laughs) We appreciate it. (laughs) Thank you, gentlemen. All right. First of all, I think we want to give all the presenters a large round of applause here. They're upstairs watching. I think that was great. Uh, Special shout out to Mike, Ian, and Devin, who are wrapping up their college careers here with this project. So congratulations to all to finish up here. Uh, A couple other people I want to thank who wouldn't, who without, who who without this wouldn't be possible. Uh, First is we want to thank Dr. Awesome, Mr. Clint Wright here, uh, the broadcast studio managing engineer for our facilities. He is responsible for all this, set it up, and did a great job of running the technical side here. Also. I want to thank the chair of the department, Dr. Nam. Oh, I mean, Professor Jeff Halliday here. Uh, without his support, this wouldn't be possible here. Uh, and what we're going to do, we're going to get to do this again in the spring. So I encourage all of you to check it back out in the spring. We'll be back with about 30 groups or so presenting their live semester-long original research. So I want to thank everybody out there for tuning in. Until next time, I am Dr. Ryan Stover signing off for everyone behind the scenes. Thank you all.